I wanted us to spend just a few minutes of time thinking about the long history of college sports and what that's meant to our society, not just in terms of the NCA, but, but a little more broadly, and to, to think a bit about the leadership that the association itself, you, the members, over the decades have provided to society as well as to those individuals who play our games. I think it's really useful for us to remind ourselves that the association was founded over 100 years ago now out of a deeply felt sense of crisis, especially in, uh, around the game of football. There was, there was a profound concern that college sports uh, were, were not what they should be and that they indeed maybe shouldn't have even existed. But college sports has been confronted with the need to respond to societal needs and respond to societal demands throughout that period. And let's be honest, we haven't always done it elegantly, to say the least. But whatever the issue has been, whether it was 115 years ago in the crisis of football or any of our issues today, this association, since its beginning, has always managed to step up. It's been a century of collective progress of this organization, these individuals, you, coming together collectively to hold together college sports. And we need to at the same time recognize that that leadership, your leadership, our leadership historically has been a very important force in society for societal change. That's not fundamentally different today than it was back then. It's not just about us having a bias for action. We have all of our meetings and we all want to get together and do things. But it's also about recognizing that we're an agency for change, for progress, for making positive impacts in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people on a regular basis. Now, we don't want to kid ourselves. This has not always been, not always been easy. It's sometimes been messy, very messy, because what we do, what you're here for in this convention is to exercise a democratic process. We make all of our decisions, our policies, all of the major choices are handled here through a democratic process. It's something that the broader public and the media always miss when they talk about the NCAA. They tend to think of it as a monolithic entity, something like the NFL. Couldn't be further from the truth, of course. It's this democratic process that we use, and democratic processes are rarely proactive and they're almost never unanimous. But by the time, but what we've seen time and time again is as we've confronted societal issues or the issues of sport, you know, the associations managed to rise up and deal with the really hard issues and to move the needle on sports in ways that were critically important to us at the time, but overall had a big impact on society which in the end is even more important. Let's think about this issue of health and safety, for example, which was really at the heart of how we got started. The association was rooted in a deep concern about protecting student athletes. Back in 1906, as we were beginning, there were 14 young men who died that year playing football, 14. Now, I know what the world would be saying right now, 14 young men had died on the football field this past fall, but there's way more than 10 times the number of playing football today. It's probably 1,000 times, but let's say 10 times. That would have meant that 140 young men would have died this year playing the game of football. Imagine what that would have looked like and felt like to all of us. There were calls to ban football, to end college sports, uh, the, everyone was questioning why we were doing this and what was going on. The association was founded out of that need to both protect students and to reattach college sports to the academic endeavor, to, re, to reinsert it into higher education. And we continue to do that day, today. We continue to work on all of those same issues. You know, Bud Peterson a minute ago mentioned the work that we're doing on head trauma in college sport. You know, we are, we, this association, are leading the charge to resolve the issues of head trauma through the CARE Consortium in a way that has never, ever been done. 
know, led by Indiana University, University of Michigan, there you go, Percy, blue's in there all the time, <laughs> Medical College of Wisconsin, big collaboration with the Uniformed Services University, and around 30 other schools across the country. There's a chart up there, you can see them all. This $64 million that we've put forward, you and the Department of Defense collectively have contributed, has now got data, I heard Bud say 40,000 students, it's actually 50,000 student, student athletes and, and cadets at 30 different schools to now create a database of information that's magnitudes greater than anything that's been done before. And you know, we're the right people to do this. This isn't something that should be an afterthought to us. We should be leading in all of these health and safety issues because that's what higher education is supposed to do. Our schools, the schools represented in this room, is also the home to the greatest research minds, the greatest scientists, the greatest medical researchers in the world. We're not supposed to be passive receptors of solutions. We're supposed to be contributors, people inventing those solutions. We discover them. But here's the hard part. It's not enough for us to just do the science, to just do the research. We also, and this is the NCAA's role in particular, we have to put that science into action. We have to take what we learn in the laboratories and in the medical community and move it over to the rules, move it over to our policies, move it over to our practices so that we're doing everything we can and we know every night we can go to bed saying, yeah, we're doing everything we can to take care of our student athletes. That's what leading in health and safety looks like. Asking the hard questions, doing the research, basing decisions on good, sound science, and being bold enough to say, yes, we're gonna do X, yes, we're gonna do Y, even though not everyone will love all those answers. And that's what this membership has a history of doing. If you look at another huge area for this nation, the tumultuous times of the civil rights era, an era I'm old enough to remember the civil rights era. Percy, of course, is old enough, and a handful of you here lived through those, that era as well. And we can well remember that sports played a critical, critically important role in breaking down essential barriers. Sports provided an arena where all of this played out. And it was the leadership of individuals using sports as a platform to help drive change in America. People like you and jobs that you have, coaches, student athletes, administrators, faculty members that stood up and chose to lead, and in some cases doing that by putting themselves and their careers in some significant risk. Now sports, including college sports, was then and remains a really important catalyst for change. I, I love this picture of the 1966 Texas Western team. You know, for those of you that aren't schooled in basketball lore, even civil rights lore, this is the first time that five African Americans started on a team on a champ in a championship game. They won that championship title, beating Kentucky in an extraordinary game. And when they did that, it changed the image of America for everyone because of that platform, because of that event. Now, we also need to be clear that there's been plenty of resistance inside college sports to change, and some of that's occurred, you know, despite all of our best efforts. But the NCAA's leadership has consistently demonstrated the value of inclusion to our nation. And from that point, there's been, you know, that point on in history, there, there's been pretty continuous progress. Not even, it's been lumpy, and it's been hard. And to be sure, it's an incomplete journey. But when we look at some of the comments Bud was just made, making about the Board of Governors now, today, continuing to push the association to promote excellence, excuse me, inclusive excellence and accountability, when we look at the positions that we're taking now, we see a really powerful story. Now just this last fall, at Brigham Young University, we hosted the fourth Common Ground Forum, a forum to foster inclusive and respectful athletic environments for participants from all sexual orientations, genders, identities, and religious beliefs 
recognizing that in this room, in our society, in our association, there's a lot of conflicting and difficult decisions that have to be made and the conflicting views that we all bring to these kinds of debates is essential, but we, this association, has to be willing to have respectful conversations about them. Our society needs so badly right now to have people to be able to sit down and talk and not shout and scream and work through our issues and our difficulties. Tackling these issues requires lots of different voices that could be engaged in conversation with tenacious leadership, but a willingness to listen and talk. And many times, students have been at the forefront of all of this. You know, like these, these players that are on that slide showing support for the LGBTQ rights while they were playing a game in, in North Carolina, you know, with those socks. I, I'm proud of them and the association's progress and commitment and to continue to be on the leading edge of these important social issues. We can and we must provide leadership through our convening power, our ability to get people together, because when we ask people to come together, they come together. It's pretty remarkable. But we also have to have courageous individuals, people that are willing to step out and say, yep, we're, we're willing to take a stand here. And we've not always, we, the association, have not always been on the right side when things started out. You know, for those of you that remember or know the history of Title IX, when Title IX was first initiated, the NCAA fought it, and fought it hard. We argued strongly against it. Indeed, it wasn't until 1981 that we had our first women's championship. That's not very long ago at all. But fast forward to today. Where are we now? Now, we are the drivers of progress and growth in the support of women in athletics. In 35 years, 35 years is not a long time. In 35 years, we've gone from 64,000 women playing our sports to, to, to today where we have more than 216,000 of them, nearly a quarter million student athletes that are women. This year in our championships, the, there were more women playing in our championships than men. And our commitment to Title IX, the commitment of you, the membership, to Title IX has provided millions of educational opportunities for the young women of our country. That's reinforced the central role that women now play in the NCAA. And, it's continu and we continue to provide leadership in all of these fronts. Again, as, as President Peterson mentioned, we've still got a lot of work to do, but even right now, we're working hard to try and develop education and policy to prevent sexual assault on our campuses and rid that scourge from our society. Again, great progress, something we should be enormously proud of, but there's a lot more to be done. When we go back in time a little bit, and again, hard to think about it you know, from the vantage point of today, but we go back not very far ago and look at academic reform. And, and what we see is an association that's made up of colleges and universities. It should be pretty natural that you know, academic success is part of our DNA. It's why we exist. It's what we do. And yet, it's been a pretty enormous challenge to keep our focus on the academic success of our students. Uh, now we know, we, everyone here, now we know that it's the receipt of a degree that makes a difference in people's lives. That's what enables them to do extraordinary things throughout their lives. And it shouldn't be lost on any of us here, especially, that NCAA sports make higher education accessible to a huge swath of the American society, people that may well not have had those opportunities otherwise. Today, access to higher education is more important than it ever has been, and every year it's going to get increasingly important. And equally, if not more important, you, the members, and the NCAA as an association provide $2.7 billion, $2.7 billion in scholarship support for all of our student athletes every year. But you know, you look back, not very far, uh, and, and you'll see a somewhat different story. Academic reform was not always fully embraced by the membership. There's been historically a lot of fear about the impact of raising academic standards on the sport and on students' abilities to compete in the classroom. It's caused a lot of anxiety over those, over those decades. We've had a very bumpy road 
to standards raising, with standards, you know, being raised one year and lowered the next and eliminated in some cases and arguing all, all along the way, acting like democratic processes do. But you know, people have worried about, legitimately of course, about disparate impact. They've worried about how it's going to affect competitiveness. They've worried about what it might mean for recruiting. Here's the thing that I want you to remember, and, and some of those data make clear that we've had up there, that every time this association in any one of our divisions has raised the bar academically, our student athletes have risen to meet it. Each time, every time we've raised the bar, set higher standards, higher expectations, they always get there. You know, I, I love what you said in, in that video, Percy, and, and your words were great. We got to remember it's our responsibility to provide our students with a real and viable education. That's the exchange. That's what we're committed to. We're, we're educators. But we got to lead to make that all work. We have to accept our responsibility to be leaders to make those things come true. Each division out there, you've all taken important steps to increase your academic success. And the rising graduation rates that we see over the past decade have, make it, have made it clear that we've got a lot to be proud of most notably our students and their willingness to do what they're supposed to do. At the same time, we need to recognize that higher education today, your campuses are being strained mightily. There's a lot of pressures on you right now, economic, political, demographic, a lot of challenges. And so we're going to find our resolve around academic excellence being tested again and again and again. And we're going to have to work together to keep our eyes focused on academic success so that we don't lose track of what really is going to make a difference for our students. So, you know, as I've been talking about strong leadership that's been displayed in the past, and it's been life-changing for our student athletes and even on society, I, I want to point out how proud I am of what we together have accomplished and how excited I am to look forward to what's to come, even though we know we've got plenty of challenges out there that can become wonderful opportunities. The work that we do now, the work that you're doing in this meeting, is very impactful, which is sometimes hard to see in the moment. It's sometimes hard to step back just a little bit and look at the debate that you're having in one council or one set of board meetings and realize that you're starting to set the framework for what's going to come next. When I look at the horizon, I think when all of us look at the near-term horizon, we've got a few issues out there where we still need strong leadership. We need values-based, bold leadership. You know, we've made great progress around inclusion and diversity, but when we look at our coaching ranks and our administrative ranks, we haven't made very much progress there. We've got a lot of work to do there. Bud mentioned what's going to happen with sports wagering coming along. Sports wagering is going to have a dramatic impact on everything we do in college sports. It's going to threaten the integrity of college sports in many ways unless we're willing to act boldly and strongly. Uh, the legal and political landscape that we live in right now, it's unpredictable. In some ways, it's, it's going to provide us with some opportunities. In others, it's going to challenge the heck out of us. But we've got to be ready to deal with whatever comes out of that process and that environment. In a highly dynamic environment of, that we live in, an environment where the world's changing in ways that are pretty hard to predict, the single most important thing for us is for us to lead with our values by applying our values as a template against which we make decisions. And, and in the end, we'll be ready to take on any of those challenges as long as we say, how does this fit into the values of intercollegiate athletics. Let me give you a really simple example because it, it's a fun conversation that's going on in this convention. Every, every room I've been in, in fact, it's come up. I brought it up where somebody else has. And, and that's the debate about esports, right? Should the NCAA be involved in esports or not? Does this make any sense for the NCAA? And, and I don't know the answer to that. But, but let's think about this for a minute. Here we have this rapidly growing global phenomenon. It's exploding on all your campuses. You all have teams on your campuses already. And as, but, but for us, we have to sit down. You will have to sit down and say, what do we want to do with this? Does this make sense? Is this even a sport? Is it athletics? Can we manage it effectively? Well, we need to lead that debate 
by asking some few central questions around our own values and whether or not we can address some of the concerns that exist in esports by applying our values to mitigate any of those concerns. We know, for example, that esports are hugely gender biased, right? 95% of men playing those games. We know that a lot of the content is hugely misogynistic. We know that some of the content's really violent. We don't particularly embrace games where the objective is to blow your opponent's head off. We know that there's serious concerns about health and wellness around those games. That's all true. But we may have an opportunity in front of us to apply our values to esports and better align those games to our values to change not just what happens in our activities, but what happens across your campuses and more broadly what, it, what happens in society. We don't want to ever change our values to fit a game or some other entity. We want to change that entity to fit our values. And if it doesn't, then we shouldn't be doing it. It's pretty simple. We have to lead with our values. That's how we need to make decisions, whether it's wagering, legal environments, esports, anything else that we do. Now, over the past decade, we've had some pretty enormous challenges, very unique, very, very challenging things that we've had to deal with. And each time, we've collectively come up with sound solutions, sometimes in fits and starts, sometimes with rancor, but we've always got there. And I'm incredibly confident that we'll continue to do that as long as we lead and are willing to lead, and as long as we're willing to lead with our values first. Now, what I want to do is I want to close tonight by reminding ourselves why we do this. What's at stake? What's the positive outcomes in this? It's really easy to, you know, when we're in the throes of a debate or, you know, some argument to sort of get distracted and think that the debate, the debate of the moment is the real issue. And I wish I had words to really describe the realities for our student athletes and what it can provide for them. We saw last night at the honors banquet, for those of you that were here at our honors ceremony, th those extraordinary men and women, former athletes, and what they've accomplished. And you wish you could just bottle that up and say, this, this is what it's all about. I, I, I don't have words to describe that. I wish I did. It takes Shakespeare or someone to do that. I want to thank you for your leadership and your engagement. You're making those kinds of things possible in the lives of nearly a half a million young men and young women. So thank you very much for that.